The CT Sports Talent Show. My name is Christopher Saunders, and I'm pleased to have on an Assumption Associate Head Coach for Men's Basketball, part of the NE10, Garvin McAllister. And also, too, he's a Connecticut guy, used to play at NFA. He's kind of been around the block, and I'm sure we'll get into that. Uh, Garvin, I appreciate you coming on, man. Chris, thanks for having me, man. You know, it's awesome to be able to talk to, obviously, college coaches for basketball, because especially even though basketball season is still many, many months away, we're about 40 days from the high school football season, it's always good to kind of pick the brain of college coaches, because recruiting is never kind of fully shut. It's always that season, you know, and uh, being able to talk with you is going to be awesome. Uh, before we get into, obviously, your time in Assumption, some of the other schools that you've been at, you know, I mentioned that you were at, at NFA part of the ECC, and in my constant conversations I've had with coaches, both a part of the conference, but just in other sports as well. It doesn't get the recognition I think it deserves because it's in a part of the state that a lot of people particularly don't really hear about because it's obviously the FCAC, and it's the SWC and the SEC. But the ECC is quite competitive, especially in basketball. Yeah, I think it's one of those things. There's not a whole lot of cities in the ECC. You know, when you look at Hartford and, like you said, the FCAC, the NBL, um, all of those places have much larger cities. Uh, the ECC is pretty much dominated by Norwich area and New London. Um, but get get some good basketball. I mean, if you go down the list of guys that have come out of the area, um, some off the top of my head that I'm thinking of, like Shane Gibson at Killingly, super under-recruited and undervalued kid. Um, obviously I'm biased, but RJ Evans, um, Chris Dunn. So you get some hoopers every now and then. Um, and I think, again, it just goes to, goes to show you, like, mm -hmm. basketball is being played everywhere. Uh, you just got to, as a college coach, do some research and go do some digging and go find your guys. As you have aged, and obviously you're, I think you're a couple years older than me because I just turned 30. I graduated in 2011. You graduated in 2007, you said, right? Yep. Yep. So you're not too much older than me. So in your old wise years, quote unquote, right? You know, when you were playing basketball, and I don't know how much you followed as far as the high school game after you graduated NFA, but just in terms of thinking like a coach, right? When you saw the talents that were going in certain places, you don't have to give names or anything or where they went, but did you kind of think to yourself like, hmm, if I was in that situation back then, like I am now, Maybe things could have been different. Maybe I could have done certain things What me, with me being a coach and trying to pull these kids. Does that make sense by any chance? Yeah, absolutely. I think that at that time, um, like prep schools were, they were prominent. Like not, they weren't as prominent as they are now. There were just, some of them are just starting up your Putnam yeah. Sciences of the world. They were just kind of getting the tires rolling. The yeah. St. Thomas Moore was a staple. Marianapolis prep was a staple. Um, and obviously the the chokes of the world were still around. So the options were there. I think at the time we just weren't as educated on that type of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I, and I think it's a case by case basis. Um, I think the one thing for me in particular that I would have did better was take mm -hmm. care of my schoolwork because then naturally your options are going to open up. And I don't think kids understand that part of it. Like they hear it, they hear it, they hear it, but they don't know what that means. Mm -hmm. So Yes, if I took care of my schoolwork, then maybe we can talk about prep school or maybe we can talk about some other options. But I think it starts with that. Um, I think if you look at like an RJ Evans, we'll take his story, for instance, like mm -hmm. no prep year, just did his four years at NFA. It's hard to get to the Patriot League now out of out of the ECC. It's, it's hard. Um, so I would understand where a kid that gets borderline recruitment may want to if you're taking care of business in the classroom, you may want to go and try yourself in the NEP sack. I, I could understand that. Um, but then some of them don't make a lot of sense. You know, some of them, your recruitment is going to stay the same no matter where you transfer to. Um, again, because maybe you're not taking care of your schoolwork or maybe you just don't work that hard. I don't know. Um, so I think it's case by case. Uh, mm -hmm. I think in my case, uh, you got to do some other things before you can talk about that. But I think if you're checking all the right boxes and your recruitment just still isn't there, mm -hmm. there are great options um, in New England in particular to kind of try to help that. No, I don't know how much as far as if you've noticed or if you heard about some of the rule changes with the CIC in terms of basketball, but there is no more two free throws after five. It's one or one free throw. Rather, there's no more one and ones. It's two free throws after the five fouls and eat all, you know, all fouls from the first quarter, get a race in the second, the third and the fourth. And also, too, there is going to be a shot clock going into this season. Um, I don't know. I'd love to get your thoughts on that, because I think Connecticut was one of the last 
states to kind of get the shot clock, if I remember yeah. right. What's your thoughts as far as that with the high school game, that and the free throws? Yeah, I think – I feel like the free throws – correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like that's um, on the women's side right now, and at least in college, they're doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like at the college level, we're the only – in the world where basketball is played in halves. So I just feel like those type of things are trending and they'll probably get to our level too at some point, just don't know when. Um, so I don't mind that stuff. You know, it doesn't, not, it doesn't change the game, still the game. Um, and what was the second question? I'm sorry. What was the second part of that? The shot clock. Shot the clock. shot clock. The shot yeah. clock. Yeah. Um, about time. I, I get it. Like I've, as a point guard coming out of the ECC, like I, I was fortunate that our teams never had to play stall ball and all that. And, and my coach knew that we wanted to play at the next level. Uh, I understand some of the schools that I, I've talked with guys about this. I get where they're coming from, um, you know, make it fun and keep it the same. And I, I don't know if you want to, if you want guys to get better and the natural progression of things is to get recruited and, um, to get yourself out there, I think a shot clock is one of the best ways to actually now make coaches coach and then see what a player has, um, how he can manage a game. What does it look like when the shot clock gets down to 10 and you have the ball in your hand, right? Like, I think all of those things are beneficial, especially for when you talk about producing players to play at the next level. Um, if the goal is for everybody to have fun, then I understand the other side to that as well. But I think kids play basketball competitively no matter where you're at. I think if they had an opportunity to play at the next level, they would most kids so this this is another step in that direction it's going to be quite an adjustment i think for the first couple games maybe first month month and a half and as i've had you know had many coaches tell me they're you know we're really going to see the coaches that can coach and the ones that are a little bit behind in terms of getting the adjustments going but we'll see how that kind of goes when the season comes about uh coach i gotta ask you because now you know when you sent me over a little bit of your bio, I didn't realize you coached in so many different places. So you must truly have an appreciation. And I'm not saying, no, you know, every coach has an appreciation of where they are at their current point, because as my old professor told me, when you're taking the ladder, you know, everything's a ladder effect, especially in sports, right? Because every, every foot that you're going up the ladder, there's somebody kind of helping you in one way or another. I was talking with a coach who originally played at New Canaan. Uh, Mad Dog Russo's son, uh, Tim Russo, and now he's coaching at the Division One level, was at UConn previously uh, for, I think, a year or two and won a championship with them, right? Um, for you, as you've taken your steps, right, are there any coaches, maybe players, uh, you know, anybody that you would like to share that kind of helped you? Because in each place, you had quite the opportunities while you were there. Yeah, I've been fortunate to work for some really good people, honestly. Um, and that sounds cliche to say, but every person that I've that I've worked for has helped me in, in some way, or, or would or would try. And they're one phone call away. You know, coaching is a tricky business. Um, obviously, there are some guys that that go above and beyond. Um, so, like Mark Coons at Post right now, head coach at Post University. That's that's one of my guys. Worked for him. Um, I know he's a phone call away for anything in terms of just life stuff or uh, basketball stuff. Um, I've, uh, Scott Fosher, who I work for now, again, just we've been together for so long. We're both younger guys. We kind of grew up together in this game. So uh, a lot of the things I'm bouncing off of him are life related and basketball related. Um, so I would say those two guys in, in particular, um, not so naturally the last two guys I worked for. <laughs> um, and then Mike Donnelly, who I played for. Um, He's just, again, we have a great relationship as a coach and player. And now, now that I'm in the coaching world, he's another great resource um, to use for, for things. So. You know, when you mentioned to me that you were a point guard and obviously I'm a, I'm a baseball junkie, right? And even though the game is kind of, I don't know if you're a baseball guy, but the game is starting to change in baseball where now catchers are, especially in the younger levels, they're not calling their own games. I saw something where now in high school, I think in Connecticut, they'll be doing the pitch com where now there'll be pitch communication between the pitcher and the catcher, obviously from home plate or uh, not home plate, the, uh, the managers with the catchers and such. So that way they don't have to think as much, but a lot of times managers up until even less than 10 years ago, were coming from the catching position because that's a broad game. You're seeing everything you have to constantly think. I've always believed, especially in basketball point guards specifically are kind of like the extension of the head coach. You're the one making the calls. 
you're doing, you know, you're in constant communication with the coach, with the assistant coaches, you're having most more often than not, you're bringing the basketball up as well. Um, did you ever think when you were either playing or maybe you were just watching a game that you playing the position that you were at was help preparing you to be a coach, regard, regardless of what level that was? Yeah, um, I was fortunate. I played for some really good coaches, also really realistic coaches that helped me realize like the chances of me going to the NBA were very, very slim. Um, but I also saw the game um, for for a young guy. So. Yes, I think the first time a point guard hits a pick and roll and they know it's the right read, that starts the wheels working for how to see the game and how to fit the pieces together. And then naturally, I think if you fall in love with that process, um, thinking one step ahead, two steps ahead of the defense from a point guard position, then yeah, naturally, you're going to take the coaching. Then it's the psychology piece of it. How how good are you at interacting with your teammates? Um, if you can get the most out of your teammates and they trust you and things like that, then you'll probably be a pretty good coach. Um, if your guys hate you on the court, but you see things five steps ahead, you won't be a, a great coach, right? You, you might be able to coach, but a great coach, you probably won't be. Um, so I was definitely fortunate. Um, Neil Curlin at NFA. Um, I, my AAU coach was Gino Oriema. So I played for him for four years. He's fascinating in terms of the X's and O side of it. Um, so those guys kind of helped me transition into coaching when the time came. When, when you talked about... Um playing the position at point guard, right? And obviously you played at NFA and you were kind of doing your thing and such. Um, was it something that you did on the court or when you were coaching that you feel like was one of your bright spots? Because obviously being the extension of a point guard at the coaching positions, being able to communicate that or maybe seeing things that other players at certain positions, either at the four or the five, are not particularly seeing. Um, do you have a particular memory that you would like to share or maybe something that you'll just never forget? If you can. Yeah, I think it's tough as a to say from a player's perspective when I was a player, because naturally as a player, you're going to be very selfish on the court. You're going to compete, but you kind of want you want to win for you, too. Um, and as a coach, you kind of get out of that experience and you can look at it from a bit a broader perspective. Um, so I think some of the things for me, I, I wouldn't say it's like one thing that jumps out. Obviously, the winning, you know, we were very, very good at Nichols. Um, and kind of watching that all come together was special. Um, and and you, I'm, I'm happy for those guys in those moments, but there's a ton of moments like that. I think um, getting to the playoffs with this assumption team and getting a, a playoff win meant a lot to the team. I think it was special to kind of watch those guys go through that. Um, man, there's a lot of, it, it's, I, I wouldn't say it's one thing. I would say it's the moments of like for the kids, you know, cause you see it, you see it, a change in them in terms of when they are truly happy. This generation is so cool that for them to get outside of themselves and show like real emotion, it, it hits you. So I, I would say like, obviously the really good Nichols teams, but I mean, there's a bunch watching guys achieve that hit their goals. You know, um, those are the types of things that kind of keep you going. And when you are in the pregame, giving a pregame speech for a big game, that's what you're thinking about. Like, I can't wait to see their face when they realize that they did it. You know, it's like, yo, you did it. You did it. You said you did what you said you were going to do. So that, that type of stuff is exciting for me. You know, it's it's moments that you'll never forget. And I think it's awesome that you have that with you and you can carry that on now that since you were done playing, I'm sure you're playing rec or kind of doing whatever when you can, but you're focusing on the coaching aspect and trying to get yourself as far as possible with that. Uh, Garvin, it's always great to be able to have on a Connecticut coach, especially someone at the Division II level at Assumption. Um, now, I know I saw something on Twitter and I would love for you to be able to share that. Uh, something that has been going on, you could share as far as the details of that, but you were mentioning how uh, Windsor, uh, one of the Haven schools, Southington has been a part of this program that you were going to speak of. So the floor is yours. Yeah, so um, we're hosting an Assumption shootout. It's a annual tournament that's gone on way before we got the job at Assumption. We just kind of kept it going. Um, and it operates like a team camp. And the way we run it is we run it in a tournament style uh, format. So there will be two divisions, um, depending on where your team is at in terms of talent and health, depends on which division you want to play in. And you're guaranteed four games. Um, we have four courts, four college courts up at Assumption, our main court, and then the recreation center. Um, and the goal is to be able to see the local Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut teams um, play with each other in our gym, 
um, and get other college coaches there. They have, we have board certified refs. Um, so it runs similar to like an AAU style uh, mm -hmm. event where you're going to have your four guaranteed games and then tournament style play after that. Um, we've been fortunate to, you know, have heavy hitters like Windsor every single year come in and compete. Um, and we get talent. I think it's beneficial for Connecticut teams to get up there because, you know, we've offered somebody every year at our, at our tournament. And I think even if it's not for us, just getting your guys in front of the, the local schools uh, in, in New England, like Worcester State will be there, you know, Keene State will be there. So just getting your guys recruited, um, a huge step is that is getting the awareness early so that we know where to spend our time as coaches when, once our season picks up. Um, and then conversely, like there's a, it's a good opportunity for you to have a, a coach to have an alumni come back, coach their team before they go back to college or whatever. There's a lot of guys use that as an opportunity to get their older players to come back that want to get into coaches one day, get their feet wet right before they get into college. And honestly, it helps us as young coaches identify, oh, he could be good one day. He could be a good coach one day. Well, who's that kid? So again, yeah, we're trying to use it for exposure. Um, we'd love to have more CIAC schools representing. Um, but yeah, we're working on it. I think it's awesome that you're, you know, especially in the day and age of which college and high school too, is very competitive, both in terms of the games within the playing field and then outside when you're trying to get college recruiting kids. And then also high school is trying to make sure that you're getting the best teams possible. And I think it's awesome that Assumption is willing to open their doors to not just, because very easily it could just be, oh, this, this is just an Assumption thing and that's it. But no, you're opening the doors for so many other schools to be able colleges to have an opportunity. And I think it's kind of like a collection of not just basketball talent full of ballers, but also to the coaching aspect, because you're having all these coaches. I mean, I was, uh, I think I was listening to a podcast. I could be wrong, but I remember hearing how when you get a collection, oh, it wasn't a podcast. It was uh, during the girls basketball uh, tournament. That was the first time happening this year where, uh, you know, they could showcase. It was a showcase. They could show them in front of, you know, uh, college coaches. And a coach mm -hmm. was telling me how it, when you get a bunch of high school coaches together, whose one goal is to improve the game and help these young women have an opportunity at the next level, wonders can happen. Well, I feel like when you get a collection of coaches who are trying to do multi multiple things, good things, there's a lot of good that can, you know, that can come out of that. Yeah, 100%. Like, we can't take everybody at assumption, but what we can do is make it a, a, a beneficial partnership for everybody. Um, you know, so we're going to open it up to college coaches. We're going to have our friends, our, our mutual college coaching friends come up, come to the gym. Um, coaches are already hitting us up, like which schools are going, because we might have a couple guys on the list. So, mm -hmm. you know, our goal is to continue to push the game forward in any way possible, I think. And, and this is one way to do it, you know. Um, and then selfishly, yes, to get the guys on campus and watch them. And, you know, now we have them right on campus and they get to see all the good things that Assumption has to offer. Garvin, always great to be able to talk with the Connecticut talent. Really appreciate you coming on. Hope you stay in touch, and I'd love to get you back on sometime maybe before the season. Sure. It was a pleasure, man. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate that. Always, man. Anytime. Now, wrap things up here in the CT Sports Talent Show. So until next time, stay safe. Mary CT stands for Connecticut talent. I'm our journey. Find them all. Go there, everybody, and be well.